Welcome everybody. For those of you who just joined, you have joined the final morning session for the second day of the NASA Gregory G. Leptuk Second Online Giovanni Workshop. This is your host, Jennifer Brennan. Our final speaker for this morning's session is Dr. John Lerter, who is a research ecologist in the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Office of Research and Development. John? Thank you, Jennifer. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll be telling you today about some work that, that we've been doing really um, over the last decade. And it addresses uh, nutrient pollution, which is you know, one of the most pervasive water quality issues, uh, not only in the U.S., uh, but globally. Um, you know, nutrients affect aquatic ecosystems, uh, including lakes, rivers, and, and the coastal ocean. And, and one of the bigger issues is our problems associated um, with how nutrients manifest in low dissolved oxygen concentrations or hypoxia. And so within the Office of Research and Development and uh, with some of our other uh, federal and academic collaborators, um, we've been working to develop tools and models uh, that we can use to assist policymakers and managers to better understand relationships between nutrients and a hypoxia and to use the models specifically for scenario forecasts to inform what kind of reductions might be needed to achieve water quality goals. So today I'll be telling you about uh, a modeling application that we've developed and specifically for this audience how we've used the Giovanni uh, products as well as other remote sensing products to inform the models. So to kind of give you a preview of, of where we'll be going today, um, I'll start off with a brief primer on, on Gulf of Mexico hypoxia, uh, give you a kind of a broad conceptual model so that um, I can later highlight the places where the remote sensing has, has assisted us with improving the models. I'll tell you a little bit about what we do know in terms of uh, trends um, in, in relation to Mississippi River nutrient loads and the sources of those nutrients as well as what we know about the Gulf response. And so we developed this, this new modeling system um, called the Coastal General Ecosystem Model, uh, really to, to address many of the mechanisms as we understand them and, and how they impact hypoxia on the, in the northern Gulf on the Louisiana continental shelf. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the context of what the modeling goals are, um, how we've applied CGEM to the Louisiana shelf, and for the most of the talk, again, um, for this audience, how we've made use of, of the satellite remote sensing. And then finally, I'll, I'll give you a kind of a brief uh, uh, look at, at how we intend to use uh, CGEM and other models that we've developed to examine nutrient reduction scenarios, um, as well as uh, how climate change could could alter uh, the way that we need to manage nutrients. So I, I think many of you are probably aware that, that hypoxia is not just a, a northern Gulf issue. Um, in fact, uh, hypoxia is, is distributed globally uh, pretty much everywhere where there's either high population densities or uh, adjacent watersheds with, with a lot of agricultural land use. And so, the, the dots on this map show the 400 plus systems globally where hypoxia has been documented. And you can see that the dots are overlaying on a uh, human footprint map that, that was developed uh, with folks at NASA. And so the, the darker red areas, uh, for example, here in, in, in Northern Europe and uh, you know, along the, the eastern and, and Gulf of Mexico are areas where, where hypoxia has, has been documented to occur frequently. And again, it's, you know, it, it's a, a human uh, anthropogenic nutrient issue uh, for most of these systems. And, and more recently, we're starting to see hypoxia, uh, probably because we're monitoring more frequently in Southeast Asia and other areas where there are uh, high population densities. So specifically, uh, 
for the northern Gulf hypoxia, um, the work that we're doing is really motivated largely by the, the hypoxia task force, which is a, uh, a confederation of, of um, states in the Mississippi River Basin, as well as the federal agencies that have water quality management jurisdiction. And so this task force uh, was enabled by some legislation called the Harmful Algal Bloom and Hypoxia Research and Control Act. And since the Hypoxia Task Force was, was established in the early, early 2000s, there have been a series of, of both scientific assessments, and these are some of the documents down here, and I encourage you to, to visit this site uh, to look at these documents. But there have been scientific assessments that have looked at um, our understanding of the linkage between Mississippi River Basin nutrients and hypoxia, um, and then subsequent assessments that have enabled us to kind of update the science as the, the research and, and our understanding of the system matures. And then there have also been a couple of uh, action plans, uh, most recently the, the 2008 and the 2013 assessments which kind of lay out the goals in terms of nutrient reductions and the hypoxic area, uh, you know, the, in terms of how we would like to manage that. And so I'll be telling you about how our modeling uh, plays into that, those, those policy issues. Okay, so uh, to begin with, um, this is a conceptual model of, of how the physics and the biogeochemistry of the northern Gulf um, interact to, to form or allow hypoxia to form. So I'm going to start over here on the left and walk through um, the delivery of river freshwater and nutrient loads. So there's, there's two parts that are intertwined in the development of hypoxia. There's a physical aspect that's necessary in terms of we have to have a, a well-established uh, stratification that, that um, effectively isolates the bottom water, and then we need to have organic matter that fuels the, the drawdown of oxygen in those bottom waters. And so the Mississippi River delivers a tremendous amount of, of fresh water to the northern Gulf. Uh, this fresh water is obviously uh, low salinity water that is more buoyant than the seawater. And so this fresh water rides over the, uh, the seawater and the, the stratification or the, the difference in the salinity, uh, the density gradient between the surface and the bottom water um, forms what is called a picnicline or an area of stratification. And so not only does the, the salinity uh, impart density gradients, but also there's a, a, a thermal heat transfer aspect that I'll get into in a bit um, and show you how we've used the satellites to inform that aspect. But effectively, there's a, there's a difference between the salinity and the temperature and the surface and bottom layers that creates this physical zone, this technocline, that isolates the bottom water. And then the second part, the second ingredient, I guess, that, that you need to get hypoxia is you need organic matter uh, to fuel the drawdown of oxygen. And so the river also delivers uh, a large load of nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, and other nutrients. Um, those nutrients then stimulate the lower trophic uh, level, um, just like adding, you know, nutrients to your lawn. Um, the fertilizer stimulates the production of the phytoplankton. Uh, that phytoplankton then uh, creates organic matter, um, and that material then sinks to the bottom. And once it's in this bottom water layer that is now isolated from the surface, uh, the degradation of that organic matter um, draws down oxygen, and because there's no longer um, flux of oxygen from the surface, we can achieve low oxygen or hypoxia. Um, and sometimes this problem is referred to as the dead zone, and uh, you can see from uh, this poor critter here in this cartoon that, uh, you know, there is some mortality that's associated with hypoxia. And then there's also, uh, for animals that are able to, to move out of the area, um, you know, animals can flee or escape the hypoxia. Um, so some other critical uh, aspects of the puzzle are, are light. Um, clearly light is needed for photosynthesis. So the degree to which light penetrates into the water column is, uh, is an important aspect that we deal with in our model. 
and also something else that uh, we've looked at with remote sensing data. And finally, the one of the other pieces that I'll talk about today is how we've used the remote sensing uh, remotely sensed chlorophyll A data to really understand the spatial and temporal variability of phytoplankton biomass on the shell. Um, so this is, you know, for those of you who are not from North America, uh, th this is the Mississippi River Basin. Um, it, is, you know, it basically covers the, the middle section of the continental United States. Um, it, it is a world-class river system. It, you know, it's the third largest watershed in the world, um, the, one of the longest rivers, actually the longest uh, river that flows from north to south, and it has a, a very large freshwater discharge. And a lot of the agricultural production in the United States is focused in the upper Mississippi River Basin, specifically uh, corn and soybeans are, are some of the dominant crops here. Um, and as a result of this agricultural land use, uh, there's been, you know, since the period when we have had data in the Mississippi River, it's been noticed or, or, or observed that there's been about a, you know, two and a half to threefold increase in riverine nitrate flux uh, from the 1950s up through the present. And uh, more recently, um, during the 2000s, the USGS has documented that, that river uh, nitrate fluxes are still increasing and that there's been about a 10% increase. So despite the, the efforts of the task force and the states in trying to reduce nitrogen and phosphorus uh, runoff, um, we're still kind of going in the wrong direction. So in terms of, of what do we need the model to, to address, uh, to inform policy um, and, and management, um, the nutrient sources in the watershed, as I, as I mentioned, are, are predominantly agricultural, um, but we also have uh, urban uh, point sources, industrial point sources, atmospheric um, deposition, um, and so it's, it's really kind of a multimedia uh, air, land, and water problem. And we need to be able to have policies that, that, that look at and examine um, nutrient loading from all of these many sources and how they contribute to the ultimate load that's delivered to the Gulf. And so what, once the nutrient loads are, are delivered from the river into the Gulf, um, you know, clearly we're interested in hypoxia. And, and ultimately, its impact on, on things that we care about, uh, you know, fisheries, recreation, ecosystem services, uh, you know, the kinds of issues that the general public is, is readily aware of. And so um, moving down to this lower graph then, you know, what the, the main goal that we're trying to inform with the, the modeling is a, is a goal that's related to the size of the hypoxic area. So back in, in 2001, when the first uh, action plan was written, the task force developed a goal of 5,000 square kilometers, and they were pretty ambitious. They said that by 2015 that, that they hoped to achieve a uh, hypoxic area of about 5,000 square kilometers. And so, you know, this green line up here shows the five-year average um, from 2009 to 2013. Um, and you can see that we're, we're still uh, well away from that goal. And because the, the goal specifically stated a date for next year, uh, we're, the, the task force is now revising that goal. But ultimately, what we want to be able to model is we want to know what nutrient load reductions are required uh, to achieve this goal. And so we've developed uh, this new modeling system. Um, you know, clearly there are other models that are available, and there's a there's a large effort of academic and federal scientists, other people that are also involved in, in modeling this problem. Um, but we felt that there was a need to to update the the mechanisms and to provide a, a model that um, more accurately described the main features of of what we perceive as the the biogeochemical. Uh, aspects driving hypoxia. And so uh, we have a, a new model. It's called the Coastal General Ecosystem Model, or CGEM. Um, and so starting from the rivers, uh, it, it receives the, the optical uh, things that affect uh, PAR, including suspended particulate matter, CDOM, um, 
as well as delivering nutrients that stimulate phytoplankton. Um, the model includes up to uh, six phytoplankton functional types, which gives us some flexibility in terms of uh, appropriately modeling the diatom community and, and other aspects of the phytoplankton community and how they respond to nutrients and, and seasonal variation. Uh, the model includes uh, two cl classes of zooplankton. All of these then contribute to organic matter that sinks to the bottom and consumes oxygen. And we've also included the CO2 system uh, because we would like to be able to examine the nexus between um, hypoxia and nutrient-enhanced uh, coastal acidification. And so kind of the, in terms of, uh, we now have the, our um, eutrophication models are, are here in the central center on the, the left graphic. And this is just kind of the, the way that it's laid out spatially. We have the nutrient loads from the Mississippi River that are monitored by the U.S. Geological Survey, so we have very good observations of those inputs. And then we also, there are atmospheric loads that are deposited directly to the surface of the uh, Gulf of Mexico. And I'll talk a little bit about how we've used Giovanni to, to uh, better represent those loads. So those feed into our eutrophication models. I've already mentioned CDOM. Uh, we also have another model that we use called the Gulf of Mexico Dissolved Oxygen Model, or GOMDOM. And the idea is to kind of use an ensemble modeling approach. Um, I won't specifically be talking about GOMDOM today, but uh, that is some work that's currently ongoing. And then from the shelf side, we have two physical models that, um, that we use to drive the eutrophication models. Uh, the upper animation over here shows the basin scale physical model, which is a uh, derivative of the Navy Coastal Ocean Model, uh, or NCOM. And uh, one of the real challenges of modeling um, hypoxia on the Louisiana shelf is that we have these three large uh, open boundary conditions. And fortunately, I've lost control of my arrow here, so I can't point this out. But if you look um, right up here in the northern gulf, um, underneath the word basin, you can see in this basin scale model, here we go, here's the arrow again, uh, the influence of the Mississippi River on the northern Gulf. And this is an animation showing uh, salinity. So the, the blue colors are the freshwater input from the rivers. And then you can see all these dynamics out here that are associated with the loop current and uh, eddies that, that form in the northern Gulf. And so one of the aspects of getting hypoxia here that correct and, and the challenging aspects is, is, is describing these three open boundary conditions for our system. And so the hypoxia model is actually being run now in this Louisiana shelf uh, domain. And again, you can see the, the, the very dynamic uh, boundary areas. And, and this animation is also showing uh, salinity where the, the blue colors are freshwater uh, being loaded to the system. And so the two regions where freshwater comes in are mainly through Southwest Pass, through the lower part of the Mississippi River, and then through the Atchafalaya River, which is an offshoot of the, the main stem of the Mississippi. And uh, I just want to point out, I, I won't have time to talk about it today, but the modeling work that we've done has really been informed by not only remote sensing, but a lot of observation-based uh, measurements. Um, in the 2000s, uh, we conducted uh, 12 different research cruises where we really focused on, on not only hydrographic measurements using CTD work, but a lot of uh, water and sediment uh, measurements that are important for hypoxia. And this table just kind of shows or highlights uh, some of those water and sediment measurements, which are really key to, to for us in terms of how we've uh, crafted CGEM and also informed uh, the GOMDOM model. Um, I think what really sets this modeling effort apart is that we observed and measured a lot of these rates. Um, all of these data are, are reported in a, a data report that we published last year, as well as um, many, many uh, publications in the peer-reviewed literature. Um, and this, this graphic here is a uh, figure that shows the 
chlorophyll A, a chlorophyll A remote sensing data product, and overlaying on that are our um, uh, station transects, and then some of the instruments and, and sediment cores that we collected. So, so moving into the satellite uh, data that we've used, we've used the Giovanni satellite data, um, and this is described in a paper that we published last year. Um, we've used uh, the Modus Aqua products um, for attenuation of surface heat flux, and I'll, I'll describe that a bit more. And then, as I mentioned previously, uh, we used the, the trim uh, rainfall product for improving the surface salinity flux and, and really for uh, improving our nitrogen loading estimates to the sea surface. And for that, we used the EPA's Community Multiscale Air Quality Model, or CMAC. And trim uh, was, was very important in terms of improving uh, those deposition terms uh, to the open gulf. And then some of the other data that we use, um, and, and I think one of the presenters yesterday uh, mentioned um, you know, some, maybe an enhancement in the future. Uh, Giovanni is great for exploratory data analysis, but it's something that, that we often need in the coastal zone and even you know, for, for work in smaller systems is we need to use the highest spatial resolution data that are available. Um, and so we have to go to the, directly to the level two satellite data for that. Um, and so we, we use those, those kinds of data. Uh, we, we assimilate uh, sea surface height. We basically use all of the available satellite altimetry data and assimilate that into the basin scale model, uh, NCOM. As well, we also assimilate the uh, sea surface temperature data into that model. And then in terms of, of satellite data that we've used to help under, improve our, our uh, CGEM model, uh, we've used MODIS and CWIFs for light attenuation uh, studies, uh, MODIS and CWIFs for continental shelf phytoplankton biomass, uh, looking at spatial and temporal variability and how it relates to the hypoxic area, and also use satellite data to look at uh, shelf sediment detritus and CDOM and their absorption properties and how they contribute to absorption of light. And so again, these are all important uh, mechanisms that, that we need to get right in the model. And uh, these, these types of data help us to, to better understand dynamics in the system. And so I'll quickly now walk through uh, some of the, just to show you um, how the satellite data has improved the modeling. Um, as I mentioned on the previous slide, we, we uh, assimilate sea surface elevation from the satellite altimetry. These three graphics show model versus observed uh, water surface elevation at tidal gauges. So these are independent data sets that are not assimilated. And it's no surprise that you know, if we assimilate the altimetry data that the model does a great job in terms of predicting water surface elevation. Um, likewise, uh, we assimilate the sea surface temperature uh, from ABHRR. And these are, are two uh, graphs showing the model in blue uh, versus the, uh, the buoy data. Um, again, these are independent data sets. And as you can see, we do a, a good job uh, predicting uh, sea surface temperature. And so one aspect um, of the model that, that once we, when we first started examining the, the observations, uh, the model results in comparison to observations, we, we noted that even though we, the model is, does a, a good job in predicting sea surface temperature, um, it's a little bit weaker in terms of getting the vertical distribution of temperature correct. And as I mentioned in that, that conceptual kind of cartoon diagram, that's really important for the physics of the system. And so what we did is we took the uh, diffuse, diffuse attenuation coefficient out of uh, a Giovanni product, and we used that to, to spatially um, prescribe how the solar radiation gets absorbed in our modeling domain. And so this set of figures kind of shows uh, how that improved the model. On, on the left, um, these two figures show what the, the model results looked like before we used the Giovanni light attenuation product or the, the KD uh, product. Um, on the left here, you can see that uh, before we used satellite data that you know the, 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 
the temperature uh, distribution vertically was pretty homogeneous, especially in, in shallower waters. And what we're looking at here is a, um, a vertical slice. Um, so from right to left, um, if you follow this line in the lower figure, and again, I've, I've lost my pointer here. Let's see if I can get it back. In, in the lower figure, the, the line moving offshore um, is the location of this vertical slice. Um, and so on the y-axis is the depth, and along the x-axis in the top figure is the distance from shore. And so the, the right figures that show the light attenuation that we, uh, trying to get my the pointer back to work. OK. the. Um, so in the right figure on the top, you can see that once we used the satellite data, then we had a, a, a much better uh, representation of the vertical profile of temperature. You can see that it's, there's a much more distinct vertical stratification um, in, in after we use the, the satellite data. Um, another aspect of, of the Giovanni products that we used were the trim data that we use to improve the uh, CMAC nitrogen loading deposition. And what CMAC does is it takes all of the nitrogen emission data, as shown in this figure here. Um, so it takes those emissions data. Um, those emissions then are, are uh, physically transported and, and, and altered photochemically in the atmosphere. Um, and then as rainfall, um, and also there's also dry deposition in the model, the CMAC model produces these nitrogen deposition maps. And one thing to note is that before we use the trim data to improve it, that out over the Gulf, um, so, so essentially over the continental US, CMAC uses uh, gauging stations for rainfall. Um, and since there was limited information in the, in the, over the open ocean, the model basically had a uniform uh, nitrogen loading to this system. So we used the trim uh, rainfall product, which gave us uh, spatially varying rainfall out over the open gulf. And after we incorporated that, we now have spatially varying uh, nitrogen deposition uh, over the open gulf. Um, another aspect that we use satellite data to, to help us better understand the system is to look at light attenuation. And now we're talking about light attenuation in terms of the photosynthetically available radiation. Um, this is a series of, of climatological uh, mean monthly um, showing the amount of PAR that actually penetrates all the way to, to the bottom, to the, the floor of, of the open gulf. Uh, so here we see that uh, during the the spring and, and, and summer, that there's actually a lot of light that penetrates all the way through the water column that can drive photosynthesis. So this is really important in terms of making the model uh, represent this kind of dynamic. And then finally, I'll point out how we um, use the satellite data to improve our understanding of chlorophyll dynamics. I'm not going to get into it in too much detail. This paper was just published in JGR Oceans. Uh, but we developed a new chlorophyll A algorithm that, that greatly enhances our ability to understand spatial and temporal dynamics of chlorophyll on the shelf. Um, so we now have a 15-year time series of chlorophyll A, um, which is shown in this upper figure. And we can then look at relationships between freshwater discharge and freshwater delivery of nutrients and how they co-vary with the satellite data. And again, this is described in this paper. Um, and more specifically for hypoxia, um, the upper figure shows here how the correlation between the inner shelf and middle shelf chlorophyll A, uh, where the strongest correlation is with the hypoxic area. And so the hypoxic area is, is generally measured in, in uh, July. And so this just shows that uh, the strongest temporal correlation uh, with chlorophyll is, is in June and July, so the months uh, directly preceding when the hypoxic area is measured. And then in the uh, bottom plot, actually, um, this is the first time, even though this has always been described as a eutrophication issue, uh, we just don't have a lot of data for the open gulf uh, in terms of being able to, to really show the relationship between chlorophyll A and hypoxic size. And using the satellite data, um, 
for the first time in this paper, we were able to strongly show or show the correlations between, uh, you know, chlorophyll A uh, in June and July and the size of the hypoxic area. And so the slopes of these lines are important. And again, are these are the kinds of things that we want the, the models to be able to reproduce. And so quickly, um, what we've shown then is, is the satellites can be used to improve how we uh, get the physics correct in terms of the stratification, um, how it improves our ability to understand and to model the, the light and the optical features of the system, as well as to understand the temporal dynamics between the phytoplankton um, relationships to river discharge and ultimately how the, that organic matter uh, drives hypoxia in the system. And so with the last couple of minutes that I have, uh, I'll just briefly show you some of the model results. Um, this is a, showing the, the annual size of the hypoxic area from 2003 to 2012, so we're modeling these 10 years. The blue bar is, is the actual observed hypoxic area as reported by uh, Nancy Rabelais' group at, at LUMCON in Louisiana. And the red and green bars just show the model results uh, for, for a duration of 10 days and a duration of 15 days. And we chose these durations because the, the cruise uh, that's used to measure the hypoxic area lasts about two weeks. So uh, effectively, the model is reproducing the interannual variability uh, in the observations. And then some of the, the information that we can get from the models that we can't get from the current observations are things like duration of hypoxia. And so this is showing from 2003 to 2010 the actual duration of hypoxia. Um, the color bar here out to this dark red is showing up to 30 days uh, duration. So the model gives us a, a new view of not only where hypoxia is occurring, but how long it occurs. And so this is important for the people like fisheries modelers and other folks that would like to begin looking more in detail in, in terms of how hypoxia affects uh, fisheries and other uh, aquatic resources. And then another aspect um, that we can get with the model that we can't currently get with with the observational data set is a look at the hypoxic volume. And again, we're looking at that same vertical slice that I showed earlier, which is uh, show, you know, going from the Atchafalaya River offshore here. And this dark blue area is the hypoxia, and you can see how closely it, it's uh, you know, kind of hugging the bottom contour. We'll let it cycle through one more time. Uh, we're in August of 2005, and in a second here, you'll see uh, Hurricane Katrina comes through and completely mixes the, the water column right there. Uh, so, you know, this gives us kind of a, a really unprecedented view um, in terms of using the model to, to really look at, at time, space, uh, and volume dynamics that we, we currently can't, can't do otherwise. And then finally, I'm running out of time here, so I'll, I'll go through this quickly. Um, you know, so we, we feel like we're pretty close to having a calibrated and validated model, and we're, we're starting to, to run nutrient scenarios. Um, what we'd like to look at is a business as usual scenario, as well as some scenarios that would be, you know, looking at the nutrient reductions required to achieve that 5,000 square kilometer goal. Uh, so we have good information on fertilizer use and trends in use, and these data are from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, we know what the trends in population are, so we can kind of project out to, you know, 2050 and estimate, you know, what the fertilizer uh, application and, and pot potentially what the river loads would be in the future based on these trends. Um, we want to also look at climate scenarios. Uh, IPCC has given us some pretty good guidance regionally that, we, you know, we might expect um, a plus three degree or so increase in air temperature in the coming century. Um, it's also expected that there could be uh, increased river discharge. And this graphic on the right shows that not only might there be an overall increase in discharge, but there could be changes in the timing of the river hydrograph. Um, and that could be critical in terms of hypoxia. And as I mentioned previously, we'd also like to look at this nexus between ocean acidification and eutrophication. And we published a paper a few years ago uh, describing the empirical basis for this based on observations, and we'd like to look at that in our model. Um, and so finally, I'd just like to conclude um, with 
some acknowledgments. I've really focused today on the remote sensing, but this whole model development aspect has been a large group effort that's involved a lot of offices in EPA, uh, colleagues at the Naval Research Laboratory, as well as other academic and federal collaborators not listed here. And if there's any questions, comments uh, that pe people would like to follow up with, uh, please, please do contact me. Um, if you also would like to, to collaborate, uh, we do plan to release the, the model code uh, sometime in the near future. Um, and we have uh, various flavors of the model. We have 3D, uh, 1D, and, and, and simplified versions of the model. Um, so we'd be interested in, in, in working with people who would like to use it. Um, or if you just would like to collaborate on a specific system where, it, where hypoxia occurs, we're, we're looking at expanding our modeling efforts uh, nationally as well as internationally. And so with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. OK, thank you, Dr. Lerner. As um, our last speaker has indicated, we will now move to our 15-minute question and answer period for the final talk of this morning's session. OK, and if you would, let's see here. Let me go ahead and if you have, OK, I've got our first question here. Your comparison of satellites with in situ chlorophyll seems very good. Was there a correlation coefficient in the slide? Did we see it? Are the values lin or log? There's actually several questions here, uh, John. So <clears throat> was there a correlation coefficient in the slide? Did we see it? Are the values lin or log? Did you use in situ surface or optically weighted chlorophyll to compare with satellite estimates? Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, uh, I was running out of time there, so I kind of sped up there at the, the end. But yes, there, there was uh, those were uh, log, log, log plots. Um, the uh, coefficient of determination for those were on the order of about, uh, you know, R squared values of about 0.5 to, to uh, 0.6. And we used uh, in situ data that were um, taken from about a meter depth um, I'm trying to remember now. I can't. I think we had looked at, at optically weighting those, and they um, the the relationships weren't different whether they were optically weighted or we or whether we used the surface data. So, in the publication, we ended up just going with the surface because we had more of those kinds of observations. Okay. Thank you. So the next question is, is euphotic depth any better as a parameter to use in models compared to K490? Is you, well, euphotic depth, you, I guess, is, is what, what we get from the satellites. Um, yeah, euphotic depth is, is very important because it, it, it kind of it gets right at the, the heart of um, you know where, how much of the water column is is uh, capable of, of photosynthesis. So the euphotic depth is is, is generally defined as the one percent light level. And so once the light is below one percent, then there's effectively there's no more that, that you know net primary production is, is zero below one percent. Um, so in the case of hypoxia. Uh, the euphotic depth is important because if we have light that's penetrating all the way to the bottom, that means that we, you know, really need to have a model that is able to to photosynthesize or, or to allow photosynthesis to occur, um, you know, as per, as indicated by the observations. And and one of the reasons that this is important for this system is that um, in the past we've relied on many kind of simplified models for this system that have just prescribed that below the picnicline it was dark. And therefore, I think we had a, a kind of skewed uh, view of, of the way that the system was operating. And after we looked at this with the satellite data, it was very apparent that um, that, that was not an assumption that, that we could use for, for models and that we really needed to have good optical models. And, and we have a, a very nice bio-optical model included um, that, that you know, allows us to uh, realistically reproduce the, the light fields as we observe them. 
Okay, thank you, Dr. Lerner. Are there additional questions? If so, please type those into the Q&A pod on the right-hand side of your screen. Also note that below his presentation file has been uploaded. If you uh, select that file with your cursor, it will be highlighted and you'll have an opportunity to download. Any additional questions? Okay. And uh, this is Jim Acker who's asking the question, John. Uh, and he said, I asked because Giovanni has a Zongping Li's euphotic depth, euphotic depth parameter from OBPG, which is our ocean biology processing group here at Goddard Space Flight Center. It's more so of a comment, but that's why he asked. Yeah, that, that's useful. And, and as I mentioned, you know, uh, we, it, it would be, I think what Chris Lins, I think was his name yesterday, he was given an overview of Giovanni and uh, he mentioned possibly linking the, the data that are currently served in Giovanni uh, back to the level two data. Um, you know, I think that would be really useful because we, we often use Giovanni as, as, you know, especially in estuarine and coastal areas as a screening level tool, but really to, to really make it useful for these kinds of systems, we have to have the higher, or we need to use higher spatial resolution. And so many of the Giovanni products are, are just not adequate for, for these kinds of systems. Um, so that euphotic depth, that, that would be terrifically useful, although we would need it at, at, at a, you know, probably the, really if we could get to the highest resolution possible with that, it would be great to be able to use in, in estuaries and even in large reservoirs and lakes. Okay, thank you for the reply. Are there additional questions? Does anybody have any questions for our speaker, Dr. Lerder? Please type those into the Q&A pod, if you will. I'll give it just a, a, a few more minutes here. Um, after the 15-minute Q&A, we will actually be moving to our lunch break, which will be two hours long. We will resume the afternoon sessions and the meeting at, tw excuse me, at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for our final uh, two talks of the day. Any questions? Okay, here's an additional question. Is there evidence of reduced river nutrient loads recently due to state or local efforts? Uh, no, unfortunately, um, the most recent analysis of this, which was done by the U.S. Geological Survey, they, they looked at, at trends from 2000 to 2010. Um, and so for the, for the entire watershed, the trend is still, the nutrients are still increasing. Although they did note that in some cases there were decreasing trends, so I shouldn't say that local efforts aren't working, um, but it still looks like even in some cases where potentially local or state efforts, and, and Illinois comes to mind, I'd have to go back and look at the report, but it seems like the, the loads in the Illinois River, uh, there is a, re, you know, a trend of reducing loads there. But overall, the, the trend for the entire basin is still increasing. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, Dr. Acker said, thank you. This is also important for the Chesapeake Bay. Any additional questions from our participants? Well, I would like to thank all of you for joining us for this morning's session. Um, uh, we do have some, some thank you. And uh, yes, the presentations will be on the web. It is my intent actually to create a separate playlist for the Giovanni presentations on our NASA Earth Data YouTube channel. Um, currently I have um, you know, individual data discovery and data access webinars posted there. Um, that will take me a couple of days. Uh, separate from that, all presentations. It might be that I create a um, a file sharing pod at the end of the at the end of uh, tomorrow's sessions, 
um, for every for all presentations to to be downloaded. Uh, I should say that they are already, you know, within the question and answer area for each individual speaker. Although perhaps I will combine them into one um, file sharing pod at the end of tomorrow's uh, webinar. Okay. Let me see if there are any questions. Um, Dr. Acker said, thank you, John. Okay. All right, if there are no further questions, thank you very much, Dr. Lairder. Um, and I think right now what we will do is we will move to the uh, lunch period. I do 